Okay, today um, I asked the question, who is Jesus? And you may be thinking of, he was a great man in history. He was somebody who definitely performed miracles. He was somebody who was good back down in history. You may be thinking of Jesus as somebody who wanted to change the world but died prematurely. You may think of Jesus as nothing else but just a normal human being who decided to do something good for the world. And you may also remember Jesus as somebody who performed signs and wonders. Uh, but do you also remember Jesus that he very often decided not to have wonders and signs? Scripture is full of examples where Jesus did, in fact, help other people, rose from the dead himself and raised others from the dead. But in many occasions when you look through scripture, you will see that there were months and weeks, when you look carefully, where then nothing happened. And Jesus just went to the mountains to pray to his father. Instead of being in the crowd where the people are, he looked at solitary places. That's also Jesus. And he often withdrew from the crowd where he just needed to be with the God, his father, alone. And I think that's important for us to remember that we see Jesus as somebody who is both. He's somebody who does indeed supernatural signs and wonders and miracles, but also somebody who is very solitary and may not heal, but heal spiritually rather. Yeah, that's my beginning for the sermon here. And I, I'd like to thank you for today that perhaps you are coming here with an expectation of finding out who Jesus is, or you have a maybe blurred understanding of who Jesus really is, something down in history which has unfortunately been distorted in your mind. But please be assured that, and that's my hope, that for today this message will give you some hope. And I pray that Jesus change the way you may see Jesus, if it is not the right way. So please turn to, with me to uh, John chapter 5, the Gospel of John, and we read from verse 1. You may have a heading there in your Bible. In the original Bible, the manuscripts, they didn't have headings, neither verses, nor commas, nor full stops. So all that was added later for us to make it easier to read. And it may say the healing at the pool. You may have the healing of a disabled man. There may be other headings there. Um, but uh, let's just read through ch uh, chapter by chapter, and that, uh, verse by verse, sorry. And that's the way we do it in Curry Chapel. For those who've been here for the first time today, we go through verse by verse and look into the context of the message that's given. Uh, normally, Pastor Bob, of course, is Corinthians, but as I now take his place, I've decided to go to the Gospel of John. And here it says in verse 1, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now after this, it says after these things, and some of your Bibles may say after this, so something happened before. So in the previous chapter, if you look back, Jesus was in Canaan, serving people there, and then there was a man who had a son that wasn't well. Actually, it was an official, a famous person in Capernaum. So he was away from this man in Canaan, and he said to this uh, man, this father, your son will be healed. Although there was a huge distance. And when this son went back, that's in chapter 4, just prior to this, this is what, at this, yeah, after this, this has just happened. And so the son was healed just by his word, praying through a distance. People were there in Capernaum, they wanted to see more of these miracles. They wanted to have Jesus there, but what did Jesus do in this moment? After this, after that just happened, a huge miracle there was a son that was almost dying when you read the story, but he was a living man again, young man again, and was well. People wanted to keep Jesus there in that place, but Jesus decided not to. What did he do? In your scripture it says he went up to Jerusalem. That's quite, in, uh, uh, quite significant, because when you go to Jerusalem, you never go down. You always go up. That's the way it is. No matter where you are on the earth, you always go back to the very center of this earth. 
The center is only in Israel, and you probably have read the news. There's a lot of trouble right now in this moment while we are here having this sermon in a peaceful area. But in that nation, there uh, are rockets flying in this very moment. And uh, we need to pray that God Almighty keeps that nation safe. So, Jesus went up to Jerusalem, leaving all the glamour and the glory behind, in a way. If it were me, I would go back and see what people now exalt you. How easy it is that in the name of Jesus, we exalt people and refer them really to us ourselves, as if we were the ones to heal, as if we were something to present the word. Actually, there are many references in Scripture that says, whoever teaches here teaches the word of God, and God, through the Holy Spirit, reveals the word to the congregation. So we are just little tools in this world. All we are are people loved by God, and he uses us in his capacity. Now, there was a feast of the Jews in Jerusalem, and uh, that's the reason why he went there, it says here, a feast of the Jews. We don't know exactly what feast he went up there, but in a Jewish tradition, even today, there are eight feasts, and three of them have to be attended in person at Jerusalem, at the temple. Uh, so we know because he went up to Jerusalem that it was one of these uh, three feasts, one of them. And these feasts are called the feasts or the festivals of the feet because people had to walk there to Jerusalem. In those days, obviously, there were no planes, no trains, no cars. They were coming on donkeys, walking from far, from the north of Israel, or even the exiles from what was then Greece and uh, Macedonia. Long distances they had to come, days before. They had to organize their travel to get to these feasts. So that's why it's called the Feasts of the Feet, because they had to be there in Jerusalem. And so what are these feasts? Number one, it's Passover. You have to be there to celebrate with all the Jewish people. What's Passover? What celebration is this? It is the Passover to remember when Israel left Egypt. Out of what? Bondage and misery into free land. What well, they thought, but it took them more than almost 40 years to reach actually that land. But it was a mem uh, like a memory and a remembrance of that time. Uh, it might have been that one. Then Pentecost, it could have been. They still celebrate Pentecost. Pentecost in the Jewish faith is where you remember the giving of the Torah, the giving of the Torah to Moses. And also Thanksgiving, though so there's a twofold uh, uh, sort of reason for that celebration, Pentecost. And then the third one, the Feast of the Tabernacles. Again, it remembers the exodus in wilderness and also the harvest when they had to pitch tents there for almost 40 years in the desert and live there in tents without a proper roof above their heads. Now, what does it tell us, really? He went up to Jerusalem. We know he went up there more often. He fulfilled the requirements of the Torah. He was often accused that he would be against the Torah and therefore being had to be put to death. But no, he was fulfilling his duty on earth, going up to Jerusalem at these feasts, at least three times a year. And of course, Jesus always had something else in mind. Because Jesus, as we already tried to find out today, is not just merely human. He is God. Please remember, that's the big difference to how often he is perceived by other people. Yeah. Okay? Okay, let's read on verses 2 to 4. So he went up to Jerusalem, and now it says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now those of you who have been walking with Christ for a long time, there was always a, I mean for me personally, there's always been an hesitation when I read this. I don't know how you felt about this, think about it. It does seem slightly out of context from New Testament teaching. 
An angel comes down, stirs the water, and somehow the first gets healed. Yeah? But let's look into this a bit more. First, it says about a pool. Uh, this pool, Bethesda, it means house of grace. Bed, Thesta, like two words. So the house of grace. That's where people wanted to go to be healed. And actually, it has been excavated with very steep steps. You can go there today. You can see it. You can visit that place. And uh, this place has been there in history. And it was built in a small uh, valley south of Jerusalem so that in the rainy season, water could pour down and fill this pool. And 200 years before Christ, there was another pool, a south pool added, which you can also see that the excavation uh, place in Israel. And that pool was then filled with the rainy water at certain times. And why, why is that important? For a Jew to be ceremonially clean, the water had to move in some way. You couldn't go in a stagnant water. It wouldn't be accepted for the cleansing. It's the emerge, you emerge into the water, yeah? like a baptism, that's what it's called, you see. Once you go into the water, you're clean, but the Jewish tradition says that it had to move. So how do you make a stagnant water move? So the second pool, what came from the north, the first, then supplied the southern pool, the southern pool, with the draining water, underneath pipework, quite advanced work. You know, the Romans were quite uh, advanced in their technology in those days already, and the Jewish people, of course, learned from that. So the water, just, there's that one pool, and there's the other one, and underneath, when people wanted to go into the water, or when there was a time of uh, worship at the temple where they had to be cleansed, the water then filled up the uh, northern pole and a uh, southern pole, and it would bubble up. There was a whirl, like a stir, yes? That is one explanation for, for that. Uh, we know that it happened. We know it was there at the time. Well, that's all about that pole, uh, that pool where they went to. This water was basically flowing underneath to the uh, adjacent southern pool, and so that it caused a stir. We also read about the pool was near the sheep gate. Now, I don't know about your Bibles. When you have your Bibles either on a phone or you have it straight in a real book, uh, Gate might be grayed out, you may have brackets, or it may be in gray or in italics. I don't know what your Bible say, you can check it. And if it is in italic, it's good, because in, in the manuscripts, gate is not there. It's a good guess, though. There was a sheep gate at, in Jerusalem, but in the uh, manuscripts, there's no gate, just sheep. And there's a reason for that. I was digging deeper, and from uh, a Messianic Jew, he is a, a Dr. K uh, Baruch Korman, he's a lecturer there in the Institute of Aramaic and Hebrew, also Greek, in Jerusalem. And he uh, explained this, that at this time, just see the context. There was a celebration, a big celebration, and at that time, you can think of probably roughly a million people that's a huge amount of people. What these people were up to, why did they come up to Jerusalem for this feast, to celebrate the festival, one of these three? So in order to celebrate, it meant they had to go to the temple and sacrifice. If you sacrifice, you must be uh, ceremonially clean. So there were these mitzvahs, they called them in Hebrew, where you had to go into a pool, there were three or four of them clustered around Jerusalem, where you had to go down, emerge, then get a sheep and go to the temple. But then the sheep had to be unblemished. So now think about, you're coming on foot from, let's say, within Israel, from the north, 100 kilometers or 60 miles for those, that sheep, whilst walking down, maybe two to three days walking, maybe longer, maybe shorter, but with dusty roads, lots of rocks all over the place, some voracious animals all around, illnesses could have happened to the sheep, and whilst arriving in Jerusalem, the sheep would have been blemished, not any more acceptable. So, we now know that there, this place, there was a, uh, an area where the 
uh, Levites were selling sheep. Again, you know, the selling and changing money. So there was a bit of money making going on right there, right there in this place. They sold sheep to the travelers who lost their sheep or the sheep became unblemished uh, blemished and couldn't be used anymore as an offering. Or simply they thought, well, let's just get a sheep there and then. But you can imagine then and now, if there's a shortage of something, if you, let's say, you want to book your train to Helsinki from here and you do it the day before, what's the price like? It's going to be a great price, is it? So at least 40, 50 euros. If you buy it much earlier, it's going to be like four or five euros. Same here. The prices for a sheep would have been a lot more expensive. So there was money making already involved here. So down where the sheep are. So it's possibly not a sheep gate, but only a place where they sold sheep for offering. That's the idea of this. Gate. Well, that is not really there in the manuscript, but only sheep. Uh, we also have five porches. That's all important to understand the whole context of the story here. Yes, please stay with me. Around the pool, there were five porches, we read, and there were sick people laying. And here, the Greek word is uh, astestenio. Assistance is in that, our English word, yeah? So people who needed assistance. And if you look carefully in verse 3, it says again, in these lay in these porches, you know a porch? It's like a veranda, you would call it. So four, five places, which there's just a roof, but with opening walls, and they were clustered around the pool, and there were these people laying, waiting for the stirring of the water. And from the excavation, we know there were very deep steps. You could see them. Even as a healthy man, you would have trouble going down because you would have to uh, use your hands and your feet in order to step down on these. Have you ever tried going a, st a steep step down and up? That's probably 60, 70 centimeters. That's very difficult to walk up just by lifting your legs. Now imagine, what were these people like who were laying there? Look at this in verse 3. A great multitude means many of sick people. And then it's explained. They were what? Blind, lame, and Paralyzed, so three things. And what are these illnesses referring to? They're referring to an assistance, don't they? If you're blind, you can't walk alone. If you're paralyzed, you can't walk alone either. So these people waited there because they needed assistance and they couldn't go alone. What I'm trying to say is that these people had somebody with them to go down to that pool at the right time. Here I have to have a little note for you. Coming back to the angel stirring the water, the elephant in the room, right? But I try to uh, zoom in in that because it is important to know. Now, in the oldest manuscripts, the end of verse 3, waiting for the moving of the water, and then the whole of verse 4, I'm reading, reading from the New King James, by the way, uh, is not in the oldest manuscripts. It's doesn't mean it's been added later. No, it doesn't mean that. Just want to make sure. All I wanted to say that the commentary I was reading refers to possibly there was a some sort. I say possibly. It might not. I just give you some commentary on this that it might have been a superstitious belief at that time. Because look in the Old Testament, and we still at this time there was no New Testament. You have to look at the Old Testament how God worked. And in those days, the uh, prophets, what were they doing usually? What was the main aim for prophets in the Old Testament? Very much like prophets of today. Encouraging people to return to the pure God and leave pagan traditions behind. That was often the case that why Israel was punished and even deserted their own land because they were doing the same evil things as the pagan people around. So there's a point in this that there was a notion of some superstitious belief. And I was uh, doing my own research in this. I didn't just follow the commentaries here. I had a very simple search word in a program on, you know, you can buy these. It's very easy. And you can even get free ones. So you put a search word in there and it spits out how many of these occurrences are in scripture. And I did this. I put in angels. And it came up to about 200 
It depends sometimes what translations you have, yeah? Unless you search for a Greek word. But if you search for the word angel in the New King James or in the King James, you come to about 200 references. And guess what? Uh, all but one reference referred to an angel that was known or explained a name or the context told it or an angel of the church, for instance, in uh, Revelation. So these angels had a context where you knew what these angels referred to. This is, teach me otherwise, this is the only angel in the whole scripture where there is no reference to what angel that really is. Is it a good angel? Is it a bad angel? Is it a bad angel of the Lord? It just says angel. Um, so you, you could argue in one way or the other. I still wanted to make a point here. Verse 4 still makes a lot of sense uh, for this story to understand and to unfold because it explains one very important thing. Why were the people there? They were there to get healed. Healed only. And that's the very important difference here because the Greek word here, it says, what already says is assistance, assistance to, towards into the water. It doesn't really mean that these people were seeking spiritual health, but rather physical, through assistance by somebody bringing them down there. And then everything is good. Isn't that with Jesus like that we put Jesus in a place that would fulfill our deepest desires and wishes? Almost like uh, you get a lottery and you buy whatever you want. That sort of idea might be in our minds. Uh, but actually Jesus is not like that. The context of verse 4 makes sense that these people were sick. They wanted to have help, but they couldn't get help just like that. What was the main requirement to get help according to verse 4? First, had to be first. They had to be first down there. Can you imagine the situation? The water started to, to stir. I keep it open, whether it was an angel or whether it was through what I explained when the northern pole was opened up, so the stir and the water came up there. It started to whirl and uh, there was a moving of the water and people were then jumping into the water, healthy one, not healthy one, in order to emer emerge under the water to be clean for that uh, sacrifice to bring at the temple. Now, there were probably roughly, roughly at least 100,000 people there queuing up. We always think of pictures we have seen, you know, these Baroque pictures in the British Museum somewhere else, or in the National Gallery. And actually, there were lots of people waiting. They wanted to go to that water. They were coming days, months earlier to get to that temple and be clean for that time. I mean, the pool we know today was, both of them together, as big as a football pitch. So that's pretty big. But it's still small if you consider all these people. So now you, as somebody who can't even walk, can't even see, need to be the first in the water. Do you think who's first? It's the one who's well, physically. Because they were there also. The story doesn't say it, but from history we know that was the case. They were all coming to this pool to, in order to be... Uh, merged and it needs to be, be totally cleaned. In effect, nobody made it. I was wondering, would Jesus ever do that? Whoever steps in first was made well, it says here. And here the word, uh, I sometimes bring some uh, Greek words, they're important, but I explain what they are. This made well is uh, vosema, vosema. And you know what that means? Physically well. So yes, possibly physically well. But people who go underneath that water, by tradition, you are clean for God. But actually, they weren't looking for that. Um, in order to be cleansed and ready for the sacrifice to bring to God, you needed to be what? Spiritually clean. You could come even if you were not well, but you needed to be spiritually clean. 
And that's not what they really were looking after. They were looking for a healing. I mean, we are all people. I mean, wouldn't you like to be healed if you have an uh, infirmity like that? Isn't it normal to be healed? So we're not judging here. I would probably be running for life to be the first. But it's just that picture. Can you imagine these guys carrying the sick ones down there and before you're in, somebody else is in there. And so gone, the chance. You have to wait yet again. It's a bit like Black Friday, isn't it? <laughs> you go first and you get your gadget you've been hoping for. And then somebody in front of you just fetches it out of your hands. And you have to wait another year, just like here. Similar to that. But we may just lose a gadget. These guys lose the walking. And even more, they're lost, they're being cleansed and go to the temple. That's what they also wanted, right? To be close to God. They couldn't go close to God in that respect. So they were just waiting there. Verses 5 to 6 then. Now we have set the context, and here it says, Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? So 38 years, um, he seems to be frequently there at the pool. Possibly he lived even close by and were begging then in Jerusalem. And every time the feast was approaching, he went there with some people who needed to carry him in order to be there to to get in the water in the first time. Now, it was a hope of uh, a very long disappointment, wasn't it, really? 83rd years. Imagine, he has been there every time. If it were the three festivals where you had to be there, where they had to be washed, three times 38 is roughly 100 times. And each time he was there was probably about a month. That's a lot of waiting in vain and anguish. But yet he had hope. You could say he had faith. Are you prepared to wait for the miracle God has maybe in, for you? For maybe a spiritual miracle, a physical miracle? Or an advice or a petition on assignment? Are you ready to wait also? Right? We know from Deuteronomy 2, verse 40, you don't have to read that, it says that from one place to another, it is explained there that when they were in Exodus, in the diaspora, basically in the, in the desert, that it took them 38 years from that time. Not 40, but 38. And that's the only time these two verses, in John and in Exodus, that 38 occurs. And both uh, places in Bible refer to a long suffering. You know, these 38 in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 2.14, they refer to people who didn't make it to the Holy Land. They were left behind. This man was very close, never ever going to the Holy Land, because if he had stayed for whatever years, he would never have gone to that pool in that time and moment. He would, died, he would have died without the healing. Uh, you look around the world of today, how many people are there who die without Jesus? We're coming back to who's Jesus. Why do we want to follow Jesus? Why have you come here to serve us today? What is Jesus in your mind? You may try to follow him, and you may be in anguish and in a hopeless following, and have an understanding of Jesus that will actually not fulfill the real Jesus. And this man has some sort of an idea that God will help him only there in that water. And we have maybe our ways of thinking of God will only heal me if I do this. Or the Lord may only heal me if I have no sin in my life. There are some verses, but there are many not. So we can't put a template on how God works, right? We try to have a template to make it clear in our small little minds. But God says, uh, 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 not like that. I'm much beyond it all. I don't need templates. I can talk to you very differently to me, Andreas, then I might talk the Almighty God to Kyle, for instance, or to Marcus, or to any of you. He looks at us as a crowd, but also individually. One day you will be alone facing Jesus. And there's nothing more. There's no pool. There's no special prayers. There's only one word, and that's the last word, Bimal ended his worship. It, it literally it was the last word he ended his worship song. Do you remember that word? 
What was the last word? It starts with J, easy. Jesus. Your song should have the word Jesus in there, isn't it? Uh, I don't like songs with no Jesus reference in there. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for the worship. It made me think. Because Jesus is the beginning and the alpha and the omega, beginning and the end. All around the name of Jesus. Okay. Okay, we read about that they didn't have assistance, these people there. Uh, this old man who wanted to be healed, otherwise he would be there. Uh, we can assume that, that he was basically left behind by whoever friends let, put him up there, and then they went their way. Possibly they were going to the temple to worship God, right? I don't care about that guy. He's there where he wants to be. I, I, I want to have my spirit of blessing. Um, you know, I looked up uh, the latest Finnish national stats about the population here, Finland, and there are certain criteria you can put in and, and spit something out. And I looked up uh, some... What, what, what is the likeness like of being in this nation, being alone or needing assistance or feeling lonely? So and actually there's statistics about that in these um, stats you can find on the internet. Estimated 7% of all Finnish around the population, adults suffer from depression, anxiety, and also alcohol-related disorders. 7%. Not including, of course, it starts from a certain age, 12. And then, that's a lot. So what is this loneliness? This man was lonely. They, he didn't really have assistance. That's what was missing. Somebody who was carrying him there. It was not so much anymore about the healing itself. I think he was more like longing for people. Do you know, I looked further in other statistics within this. You can zoom in and find some other criteria. 27% feel lonely of these uh, people of Finland, all of them, of which almost 40% feel lonely, which are 16 to 24 years old. And the most lonely people, you know who are they, according to the statistics? Are the 85 plus. You may think yourself, you may have somebody who you would really visit, but you know, it's far away, you can see them, it's hard to travel. Almost 50% of all people, when they answered this question in the corpus research, it was, uh, they feel lonely. Now this man was lonely, and all he wanted to have somebody to talk to. That's, that's my interpretation, okay? I want to bring you a message here of hope because uh, it looks quite daunting if you, if you were to stop right now. You would go home. You see, you read the Bible without Jesus. Jesus hasn't yet really fully come into the perspective of this man. It's a really daunting and black future, isn't it? And that is a reflection of every single person on earth who tries to cope alone, no matter what religion, no matter where you are. Jesus is always there. Remember, you can find Jesus written down in Quran. He's written down and known in Hinduism. He's known in Buddhism. Jesus is known that he was a healer. But the only scripture tells him that he is what? The son of God and God himself. That's the difference. So God has come down to this pool in this time to meet a lonely person. And that's the hope he wants to give to you too. If you are lonely, if you don't have anybody, or you feel some are left out, let me assure you, your long waiting can stop today. Jesus is there asking you, do you need help? I'm here. You don't need to be lonely. All he says, he looks and asks, do you want to be made well? Now, there was a crowd of people, we already know that. Remember, the staring of the water, the moment, the eagerness, the expectation, the trembling. And in that moment, Jesus comes up. Literally, he was alone there. They ignored Jesus totally. Jesus, the real help, is ignored. Instead, they were looking for a very unlikely help, where only one amongst many thousands 
would be healed, maybe even. And even if there were healing, maybe it wouldn't have lasted. Yet they stand Jesus looking at them. And Jesus was already known at that time. In the previous chapter, we know that Jesus had been up in Jerusalem already times before. So the name of Jesus was known. But the attention of these people was somewhere else. I mean, that does make some sense in our modern day in life, doesn't it? We try to, even for Christians, let's be fair. We are getting in trouble very often, repetitive sinful behavior, and then we wonder where Jesus is when it is really bad. So, basically, these people ignored Jesus altogether. He was Christ. They could, he could have healed them all if he wanted to, but there was not a single one that sought him. Their eyes were only fixed on that water rather than Jesus. Please remember also, in verse 6, if you please read carefully, it says there, and that's quite a lovely little adding here, um, when Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been now a long time in that case. So, when we come to, basically he knew already about this man. Jesus came there for a purpose. And he knew that this man was suffering for a very long time. That's again an explanation. When we come to Jesus, we pray to him, we know that Jesus knows already what is going on in my life. And then he comes in at the right point and wants to be asked. That's the difference. Jesus is one who wants to be asked. It's not like that he just does it. He does that sometimes. But he wants a communication with you. He wants you to ask him what is the right thing to do. And through the Spirit, he will reveal it to you, you know, as you can see here. Now, he asked the question, do you want to be made well? Now, really, you're there for 38 years, sick down there. Jesus already knew it, and yet he asked that question. Why would he do that? It seems redundant, doesn't it, in some way? Why would Jesus ask that question when you're in the most desperate time? And often we say, where are you, Jesus, when things are really bad in life? Why can't you help me? Similar to that. But Jesus still asked the question to you, do you really want to be made well? And when Jesus looks at you and asks you that question, there's something else than just a physical healing. Now, the Greek word here again is huggies, which is different to the previous word we read, where they just went down with the angel. Remember verse 4, and they all get, it says, got well. But he actually, they got whole. Jesus asked a different question. Do you want to get whole again? That means first spiritually be reunited with God and follow Jesus. That's what that means, what he's asking. But he didn't understand that, right? So the sick man answered then in verse 7. He answered, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So he explains it again. Uh, remember how he refers from the text I read. How did you refer to Jesus here? My Bible says, Sir. You can translate the word at master also. It's curious, you know, curious, probably a well-known word. Curious, it says here. So he understood somehow that Jesus is supreme, but he didn't understand the question. He was only concerned about the physical healing, which is understandable. But what happened if he got it? Would he have then still have a spiritual longing for Jesus? That's the question here. He was more stuck in his own plan, right? He wanted to... Jesus basically carrying him down to the stairs. Can you imagine? He wanted Jesus to carry him down there. So he had a plan how Jesus should heal him. Now, how, what is your plan? I'm sure all of you are going through some sort of, of decisions you have to make, things in life which are important, and you have plans. Uh, how often do you put Jesus in that plan the way you like it? This man exactly did that. He had a plan for Jesus that is apparently the best plan in the world. Bring me down to the water. You are Jesus. You can be bring first there. You can ignore the others. First comes first, isn't it? Would Jesus work like that? 
Isn't that uh, the mindset was so bled by what he had learned and seen by others, and by that he simply couldn't anymore think rightly in his mind. That Jesus was there just by his word, he could have healed. Now he was stuck in his own plan, and as I said, now he looked at this worldly pool in some way, and but by looking he was manipulated by his experience. He looked down and said, I, I saw how things happen. I've seen people healed in this way or that way. That, that must be right. I can't accept any other way. His, his vision was basically really blurred. He could only see in one way, go down to the pool and get the healing there. In a way, the way he understood Jesus was completely wrong and in my own experience on the street when we do evangelism, uh, the majority of people I'm asking, they have a very strange understanding of Jesus. In this country, in Finland, many do know Jesus, actually, to some extent. You tell them, and they know Jesus in a way from church history, bloody church history. All the Christians did these bad things. That's what you hear very often. And that's true. Though that's one, that's why they don't like to follow Jesus. Another one is just simply God is a punisher. How can God allow illnesses? The understanding of Jesus is very mm, cute, skewed and wrong. And so many don't even follow Jesus, therefore, and don't want to have to know about this Jesus. But when you start to talk about the Jesus of a healer, then it becomes more applicable, doesn't it? And you suddenly start to forget about the history of the church. I want to be healed right now. So... As I can confirm, we had people there being healed and come to Christ because they were in such a desperate point in life that there was nothing else that worked. And you forget all of it. And that's what I like to talk to people who are really desperate. It's much, I wouldn't say easier, but it's, it's, it's more straightforward than talking to people who seem to have a great life and everything is good. They're healthy, they have a good house, good work, good family, all is good. Yet, they're lacking one thing and one only, as Jesus said to in a previous in a different parable, sell everything and follow me. So Jesus doesn't always ask that, but he asked this man just to follow. But the blurred, blurredness of our vision, what Jesus is, is clearly hindering, hindering us to really understand what it means to follow Jesus. Now, this man was an interesting case of hope, but yet combined with hopelessness, wasn't he? He had hoped to be healed, but at the same time, it was totally hopeless to be there at that water, to be healed at the first. Yet once there, he had little hope whatsoever. Now, with Jesus, we will always win. Why? You can read even further in John and in Peter and many other verses that Christ is the living water. This water will never, ever dry up. It will always stir. You don't even need to go to the temple anymore. Can you imagine? To worship God. You can uh, worship Jesus there and then in that very moment. Verse 8, please. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your mat or bed and walk. Now this is now incredible. Uh, Jesus told this man to do three things. Okay. Instead of really going into all the details of what I've explained to you now, Jesus wouldn't even do that. He knew there's whatever I say, he wants to be healed, and he does that. Jesus does that. And he's, he, he actually asked him to do things, right, in the healing. First he says, rise. I mean, 38 years laying down there, and you rise. You know what it involves? Number one, it needs uh, trust that what Jesus says is really true. Can you rise by the word of God out of where you are in? No, you may say. I'm too far away from God. I've messed up for too long. How can God accept me anymore? And Jesus, even if it has been 50 years, you're never too old to say to Jesus, I do what you want me to do. Rise, leave that place. That's what it basically means. Leave the place of wrong hope. Wherever you might be in, it's wrong hope. Don't be there. Don't stay there. Get away from that place of misleading hope. And then it says, take up your mat. Be free from religious 
and ungodly traditions. As you know, when we read further, we won't do that today, but I will follow up on this in two weeks' time. Um, here it says, carry your map, and it was Sabbath. So quite important, because in this moment, you were not allowed to carry your map according to the law. But Jesus asked him to go beyond it, to get real freedom. Yeah? This is an incredible little uh, detail here that's often overlooked. The Sabbath was there not to carry anything and not to do any work, yet he was asked to basically break the Sabbath. So break with ungodly traditions you may be in, your set prayers you may have, the way you see God. Break with that. See how Jesus is free. Follow him. Read in his scripture. Try to get a new man of Jesus. Don't follow people. Follow Jesus. Follow the right people. Oh, well, if you have to follow people, there's people in the church you can trust. It's very important, right? And he asked a third one, walk. And that means really live. Never to return to the same place. Yeah, don't put your plow, your hands on the plow and look back. No, now walk in my direction, Jesus says. Okay. Now he was commanded to take his bed. He was laying on for 38 years. I mean, hallelujah. We're reading this story here that happens every day today. You need to see, again, Jesus in the light of a spiritual renewal. Most of us, as I can look around, are pretty healthy, I would say. But perhaps you are struggling with the spiritual health. Perhaps you can't really connect with Jesus, this Jesus we are reading here. Maybe you feel that you are not deserving it. Maybe you had too much trouble in your life already as it is, and I'm just meant to be in that position. I'm always failing. Or it might be the other way around, that everything is just good for you. I don't really need Jesus that much right now. In whatever situation you are, let me assure you, for Jesus, you never need to be the first in order to be spiritually healed. And if he grants it also physically, he will not disregard any person, whether first or last, whether old or young, whether poor or rich, educated or not, healthy or not healthy even. The spiritual health for an unhealthy person is number one priority. And if God grants their health, also praise Jesus for that. Last verse, verse 9. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And that's what I just explained. So, immediately the man was made well. Now, you know, isn't that the case? For us as believers, we experience great things with Jesus because we are in the right place. If you're not in the right place, we miss the blessings. And that's what happened here. All these tens of thousands of people missed it. They missed the huge miracle just around their back. They were all rushing down there still, not the picture to bring it back to our memory, going down in the water and trying to be in there. Yet they missed something that happened here. Uh, if you have got medics here around us, uh, they will understand what it involves. First, when we say immediately, here it means straight away. It wasn't a time of waiting. It was there and then in this moment. No waiting for 38 years to be healed. No waiting for next year, for the next day. It was there and then. And here's so. What happens when a person who lays on the back can't walk, anatomically speaking? First, the muscles have to grow. I mean, bones have to straighten. The blood vessels enlarged. We have many nurses here around us. They will know. And the heart needed to supply much, much more oxygen in this moment. So you can already say these are four miracles in one to make this man walk. And the, the reason and the, the, that this was really healing was confirmed that he was able to walk and carry his man. You know, when you are in space, that's my last remark, when you when you when you when astronauts are in space and they return, you know what people must not do to them. They just return 
on Earth. They have been there in space for a few weeks, sometimes months, then they return to the Earth, and they open it and they come out. What people must not do, they must not in nowhere touch or hug them or make them carry something. They would straight away break their bone or their muscles would break. It's also, t they need time to recover. It was very interesting to, to know that. Yeah, our, our astronaut from uh, East Germany then, Sigmund Jehn, his name, actually his son jumped on his arms. And ever since, he had a huge back aid and went to the doctor back and forth. All the muscles were gone, not his son. So, coming to an end, what can God do in your life? Think about it for a minute. Why we now pray? Because we're going to the Holy Communion. Who is Jesus for you? Is he the one that looks at you and asking, do you want to made whole rather than do you want to made uh, well? That includes it very often, yeah. But he asks you, is there a lack in you? Some sort of a lack, spiritual lack, that somehow hinders you to connect to him, to the real Jesus, okay? That's the story from this man, and he definitely understood this. There's more to come, and we will talk about that in 14 days' time. <coughs> Thank you for listening. Uh, we will now go to the Holy Communion. And uh, for those who have been...